November 2007, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, makes history with the Urban Challenge, an open competition for autonomous unmanned ground vehicles. The reason we're here is that this technology will save a lot of lives on the battlefield. We're, we will have these vehicles do tasks that right now people have to put themselves in harm's way. And with having this technology, they won't need to do that. And that's what this is all about. Dr. Tether used those words to convey the importance of this event at the opening ceremony for the national qualifying event. This is the DARPA Urban Challenge. There's a lot of good teams here. This is going to be a lot of fun. I'm pretty excited for the race. I think we have a great team. We've done our homework. We're ready to go. And we'll see what happens on race day. Having been at all the other uh, challenges, this is just a fantastic uh, event. The Urban Challenge features unmanned robotic ground vehicles equipped with the latest autonomous vehicle technologies, executing real-world driving maneuvers while obeying traffic laws and navigating around obstacles. This event is designed with one goal in mind, to bring us closer to deploying autonomous ground vehicles in the battlefield to perform hazardous tasks that currently threaten the lives of American men and women in uniform. DARPA celebrates its 50th birthday in 2008, and the agency still prides itself on creating technological and strategic advances, pursuing innovations where the risk and payoff are both very high. By far, the most recognizable development program created by DARPA is the Internet, which began in the 1960s with ARPANET and its associated TCP IP network protocol architecture. DARPA was the driving force behind advancements for stealth technology, creating the prototypes for the F-17 and B-2 bombers and the Sea Shadow stealth ship. DARPA also pioneered the unmanned vehicle industry with development of unmanned aircraft such as the Predator and Global Hawk. In response to a congressional mandate that says one-third of U.S. combat ground vehicles should be unmanned by 2015, Dr. Tony Tether and his DARPA team created the Grand Challenge, an open competition to colleges, universities, and corporations around the globe to foster autonomous ground vehicle research and development, with considerable prize money up for grabs. The Grand Challenge program has captured the imagination of people all across America and around the world and has created an entire community dedicated to fostering the development of life-saving national security technology. When DARPA announced the first Grand Challenge in 2004 with a $1 million prize at stake, over 100 teams applied for a chance to compete in this inaugural event. DARPA whittled down the field through a series of qualifying tests over a two-year period, inviting 15 teams to the final event leaving from the town of Barstow, California, and ending in Prim, Nevada, a grueling 145-mile trek through the Mojave Desert. The event spawned interest around the world, despite the fact that the farthest vehicle was only able to complete eight miles of the course. Not to be deterred by this result, Dr. Tether immediately upped the ante and announced a second competition for the following year, with double the prize money at stake, $2 million. In the second Grand Challenge in 2005, DARPA created a demanding 132-mile looped course starting and ending in Prim, Nevada. The course terrain varied from high-speed dry lake beds to narrow mountain passes. Of the 23 teams to start the final event, five teams completed the 132-mile course. The fastest time and the $2 million prize was awarded to Stanford University's entry, nicknamed Stanley. DARPA changes venues for the Urban Challenge to the streets of the former George Air Force Base in Victorville, California, where the robotic vehicles must abide by California state driving laws while maneuvering around obstacles and through intersections, T-stops, and traffic circles. Look at that. Yeah, wow. In. <laughs> Found the spot. Within Mission 1, there, as you can see, there's a total of six submissions, and so Terramax has completed number one successfully. 
Some of the 35 teams that are invited to participate in the national qualifying event participated in previous Grand Challenges and have similar opinions when it comes to the latest challenge. You don't just have to stay in the dirt road and avoid going off the cliff, but now you've got to deal with multiple behaviors, intersections, passing, U-turns, parking spots, uh, much more difficult, and it's, it's taken uh, a lot of work to, to get where we're at. It turns out driving in traffic is actually much harder than driving on a desert road. It was hard enough to, to do the desert road because it's an unmarked environment. But when you deal with traffic, the, the situations you encounter are much more complex. You have to understand where other cars are. You have to anticipate what they're going to do next. And you have to roll out the interactions. So one of the things we found is all these choices that you have. You have to go down the street, maybe you decide it's blocked, turn around at the right point. These choices are very hard to make for robots, so getting the software right to make these choices in a rational way and not get stuck is actually really a challenge. The biggest thing that is, um, was a new change was the moving traffic, you know, so um, we tried to get on that early and we tried to, you know, uh, get appropriate sensors so that what we could do is um, understand what's going on with the moving traffic. I mean, we don't make too many assumptions about what that other traffic is going to do. You know, we're not going to take a guess that they're turning left or right at the next sign but uh, we want to know that they're at least moving towards us or something like that. So it's absolutely the moving traffic was much more difficult than last time. Urban puts a little twist on it, and there's certainly a little more to have done this year. Uh, but if all were known, uh, it was spelled out as a great challenge, and then uh, everything that has occurred over the year has just uh, followed with a little more detail, a little more practice, and uh, now we're down to game time. While each team has a unique approach to creating an autonomous vehicle, there are a number of commonalities between the hardware technologies they employ. The teams generally use some combination of sensing systems, such as cameras, radar or LIDAR, and navigational systems, such as GPS and inertial measurement units. Each sensor has its own advantages and disadvantages, thus the need for most teams to incorporate different sensor types, each with a specific purpose in mind. The real challenge here is writing software that can correctly filter through the large streams of sensor data and paint an accurate picture of the dynamic environment surrounding the vehicle, determine where it should be going and how best to get there. LiDAR works much the same way as radar does, using light waves instead of radio waves. LiDAR sensors measure the time delay between light wave transmissions and the reflected signal responses to determine the range and shape of the targets in its view. Some teams rely on a number of these LiDAR units pointed in various directions to serve a particular purpose. Others use a spinning LiDAR that gives a 360-degree 3D picture of the vehicle's environment. Camera systems have also been installed by many of the teams to detect long-range static and moving obstacles, identify the drivable road surface, and locate road markings. Some teams use two or more cameras to give them stereo vision and the ability to see in three dimensions, much like a human does. The autonomous vehicles have also been equipped with GPS and inertial measurement units. Global positioning devices send the vehicle's precise location and direction to an onboard computer. In areas with poor GPS coverage, inertial measurement units predict a vehicle's location based on its movement from its last known GPS position. Many of the underlying technologies utilized by competitors in the Grand Challenge are making their way into today's commercial vehicle market. Adaptive cruise control, collision avoidance, lane departure warning and self-parking systems are all active safety systems that help prevent accidents from occurring on many of today's production vehicles. I think it's interesting that there's so many different approaches to try and solve the same problem, which is fascinating. At the same time, if you sort of look at it, the basic techniques that you see in each of the vehicles, at least for half of them, are roughly the same. So it's more how have we configured the sensors, how have we set it up, but if you look at the basic techniques, they're more or less the same. We're kind of a minimalist team. I mean, we don't have a large number of sensors or a large number of GPS. We don't even have a large number of computers in the back. So I think one of the kind of unique things about our conversion and uh, this particular car is that we just don't have a lot of equipment in it, We're trying to get the most out of what we have. We have three IBO uh, laser scanners uh, performing most of the functions of the detecting cars. Uh, we have some vision systems on the car that uh, can detect uh, other vehicles, detect lanes, uh, everything of that nature. Uh, we have uh, seven radars on the car and we have a Velodyne laser scanner on there as well. This is a, a Lotus Elise. 
It's been retrofitted to participate in the DARPA Urban Challenge. It uh, has an array of sensors on the front and back that help us to see the uh, objects around the vehicle. It has a series of, of automotive radars along the top that allow us to see along the roadways and to look for approaching traffic, as well as a camera on the top that allows us to see the lanes and the lane markings and to, to see the, uh, make sure that we keep the vehicle in the lane. It's based on a, a vehicle that's used by, uh, primarily by the uh, U.S. Marine Corps. That's the MTVR. It is, uh, um, uh, we've made this one a 4x4 versus a 6x6 and gave it uh, increased rear steer for better mobility and tight quarters. Um, it's uh, 12 tons and uh, 425 horsepower. Uh, we've got a vision system done by the Par University of Parma, Italy, Viz Lab. Uh, we have a uh, laser scanner uh, LiDAR system from IBO in Hamburg, Germany. We have a control system done by Oshkosh Truck and the high level stuff uh, on top, mission planning, route planning done by Teledyne Scientific. A team of DARPA officials traveled to Victorville, California in May 2007 to plot the courses for the Urban Challenge. They spent countless hours developing traffic scenarios, routes, testing intersections, determining obstacle placement, and working on timing. This would be the first of many trips by Dr. Norm Whitaker, the DARPA Urban Challenge Program Manager and his staff, to turn the vision of the Urban Challenge into reality. DARPA has a history of, of working with autonomous technologies for the very important reason of saving lives on the battlefield. Unmanned air vehicles, unmanned water vehicles, uh, unmanned ground vehicles, all are technologies that will eventually keep uh, our soldiers and warfighters off the battlefield in out of harm's way. Prior to making it to Victorville, each of the 53 teams had to pass a series of field tests to prove they had basic navigation and traffic capabilities. DARPA officials traveled to all 53 team sites, conducting four-hour tests that included basic navigational maneuvers such as lane keeping, passing parked cars, and executing safe U-turns. The site visit also tested various four-way intersection scenarios where the autonomous vehicle had to determine its precedence order and behave correctly with live traffic. After months of testing and thousands of miles traveled, DARPA officials invited 35 teams to participate in the National Qualifying Event, or NQE, in Victorville. Keeping the competition fair is one of the key goals for DARPA officials. The Urban Challenge has traffic judges and safety officials that oversee every aspect of the course and ensure each vehicle is safe prior to being sent out. Officials go through extensive training and spend the days leading up to the national qualifying event at three testing areas, practicing for all situations. Our job is to give them the chance to recover. In some cases they can't, in other cases they can't. Teams gathered for their pre-event briefing with Dr. Tether and Dr. Norman Whitaker. This gave the participants an opportunity to clarify any rules that, if not followed properly, could cost them during the event. The NQE consists of three courses that test the vehicle's ability to maneuver in different situations. One course concentrates on merging into crossing traffic. The vehicles must stop prior to reaching the line, signal for a left turn, and proceed when it's deemed safe. It doesn't always happen that smoothly. The second area tests the vehicle's ability to follow lane markings, merge at a traffic circle, avoid static obstacles, and perform parking maneuvers. The third area of testing consists of a large loop in which vehicles must successfully navigate two four-way stops.
after three successful laps. A barrier is put in the vehicle's way and the robot is supposed to make a legal U-turn and calculate a new course. Again, is supposed to. Officials pay close attention to every move the vehicles make, and when necessary, no illegal or unsafe maneuvers. After three days of intense testing in all three areas, the finalists are announced for the main event. The 2007 Urban Challenge sees 11 teams pass through the NQE on to the final event. So proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming. We have the green flag and the event is started. Launch the bots. The 11 competitors in the final event are given three missions totaling 60 miles. The goal for completion of all these missions is under six hours. What we do is uh, right before they launch out of their start shoot, we give them a, uh, a file, and that file has a series of checkpoints that they have to visit in order. And so they go out, uh, they leave the start shoots, and they start hitting those in order. And as they achieve them, they, um, they make their way through their course, and hopefully they, they complete their first mission, they come back into the, the finish area, and they'll get their next mission. And we do that three times during the day. So they'll actually come back and get a new mission and we'll send them back out again. They have to be able to boil down a tremendous amount of information into a simple, single, and safe action. Our first bot is underway, Virginia Tech. All right. The number 32, Victor Tango. It is a Odin. Odin. It's a Ford Escape. Charles Reinholz, the team leader. They participated in the 04 and the 05 Grand Challenges. And as you can see, they've got a lot of sponsors. Now that's the first turn right there. You can see from up above. Now the vehicle behind them, we should probably explain what that vehicle is actually doing back there. Yeah, okay. So that vehicle is a safety vehicle. And inside of it, they've got a precision driver, but they've also got someone with a safety kill switch. And if they see that there's a, a situation being created where the robot might be going out of control or, or anything else that, that might cause a safety hazard, they can stop it in its tracks immediately before any damage happens. Now look at the speed here. This is the first traffic circle, and I, I'm, I'm impressed with how fast that uh, Odin's going. That's right, and you know, again, no one is in it. Odin is driving itself. Here's Junior making his way. I'm really excited. My, my, my goal here is not to win the competition. My goal here is to advance us as a society. And, and, and the more teams prepare and get into it and are serious about it, I think the better for all of us. This is a great contrast right out of the starting gate, Grant, because 
with Stanford, they have a, a few graduate students working on the program, but they have a lot of involvement from the companies and their sponsors. And whoops, a real sharp turn there. And there it goes, Junior. There we uh, go. They've got Volkswagen technicians, uh, also from Google, Intel. I mean, these guys were swarming all over this vehicle. Now, Virginia Tech, the first car out, that's all graduate students, undergrads, and former graduate students who have now formed a company for the university that's helping uh, develop products. Number 74, Penn, the Ben Franklin team. That's right, from the University of Pennsylvania. It is Little Ben. It's a 2006 Toyota Prius. Daniel Lee, the team leader. The team consists of students and faculty from the University of Pennsylvania. Last year we had a, we were, had the, the car parked out front of a University of Penn building and we were working on it and uh, some ice slid off of a roof and came crashing down on the vehicle. Knocked uh, some of the sensors off and uh, actually put a big dent in the, in the hood and um, so that was interesting. And it looks like they've uh, made their repairs and you know, good to go. They're making their way to the first turn here. We've got another bot getting ready to go out on course. It is the number 79 vehicle from MIT. It's Talos. It's a Land Rover. John Leonard, the team leader. And uh, if you can see, there's an air conditioner on the back. I mean, I, we saw this thing. This is amazing. They have a blade cluster which is equal to 10 laptop computers sitting in the back of that vehicle. It draws 3.5 kilowatts of power. They needed to add a 6,000 watt generator. It's sitting in the back back there. It has the most sensors and computers, 16 total sensors. Uh, the weight of the vehicle when it came from the showroom was 6,000 pounds. It's now 8,000 pounds. <laughs> I think we've got a good vehicle. I think we can do some neat stuff but there's this act of God factor, you know, the gen set kicking out or God forbid another vehicle hitting us. We, bad things could happen to us. So I'm crossing my fingers that nothing bad happens, that we actually get to show our vehicle doing its thing. This thing is packed with sensors and it is taking all of that data in and creating its own world to be able to make decisions about what's likely to happen. Back here at the starting line area, Oh, this the is number 13, this is from the University of Central Florida, Knight Rider. I, I love talking to their team. They, uh, they, they were talking about how they've got the oldest car in the show, a 1996 Subaru. They're on the lowest budget, but they're here and they made the finals. We expect to win this competition. We think we have, a, we have a really good chance. We put a lot of time and energy into this vehicle, and I think we spent the time and energy on the things that really matter rather than necessarily fancy paint jobs. This is number 26 from Cornell. It's much more challenging in terms of the sensing requirements and the, the planning requirements and interpretation of everything. It's, it's very fascinating. Now, the neat part is it looks very clean on the outside. The difficult part is you can't ride in that thing. The driver's seat's the only thing that's vacant. <laughs> Terramax, it's gigantic. 21 feet long. It's, uh, it's an amazing, <laughs> amazing vehicle. But, you know, it does make sense because if you want to develop an autonomous system for military applications, why not start with a military vehicle, something that everyone's familiar with? This thing is 24,500 pounds. It stands 10 feet, 7 inches tall. And what is really interesting about this, in some of these maneuvers, they are going to be in some very tight quarters. So I asked the team, how are you going to solve this issue? They said, oh, it's easy. We have all-wheel steering. So when they get in, they said they have a better turning radius than a Chevrolet Suburban. And uh, and all of a sudden, now all, here we go with uh, the 15. All right, so this is the IVS entry, XAV 250. Oh, 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 be careful, be careful. We could have our first incident. That's a very solid piece of concrete. You're not going to move that. that came KRL is not going anywhere. Back here at the starting line, here goes Team Annie Way. Annie Way is on the move. Making its way towards the course, past the grandstands. 
We were talking about uh, Annie Lean, who was a team leader on this. Um, she, her background is in, in human computer interaction research, which is obviously speech, linguistics, talking to your computer. And, and she's been working on a, on a project before she started this where uh, it, it would just be able to recognize normal human voice instead of having to have specific code words. So here is Tartan Racing after all the extra work that we saw them do uh, probably about almost 25 minutes ago. The boss, the Chevy Tahoe, makes his way out onto the course. Boss is a Tahoe that's got everything that it takes to win. Uh, top of the line, electromechanics, uh, a great chassis, and the best software in the league. Hey, Jamie, we got you there. Yeah, yeah, this thing is scary. This has got a police siren going on it. <laughs> yeah. It kind of makes you want to take it seriously, and it's uh, it's hauling. Wow, look at it go. What you're looking at now is Corolla. Uh, this is a German entry from uh, Braunschweig University, and uh, they had some logistical problems just getting here. To give you an example, the car was shipped from Germany it arrived in Houston, where it was supposed to be. Unfortunately, the papers with the car were in Hong Kong. <laughs> and they could not get, you know, into the country, could not get it released until they got the paper shipped over. Oh, my goodness. And somebody said, yeah, well, they both started with H's. And I said, yeah, but they're halfway around the world from each other. <laughs> okay, well, here's IVS again. This time, making the left turn. Will it straighten out? It's got to come to the right for the exit. And we've launched, come on. Come a little to the right. Please come to and, the and right. And as we're talking about this, we're feeling what the designers are feeling yes. because they are not controlling these in any way. They press go and then the machine does it on its own and, and it's doing it. Look at the steering wheel. <laughs> That's amazing. Great job, all right. all right. Way to recover, team. Good work. With all the vehicles now on the course, tracking systems inside each vehicle send data back to the DARPA Command Operations Center, which resembles NASA's mission control. Officials are constantly monitoring the data, which includes speed, position, and e-stop status. This information in conjunction with visual observations from officials out on the course is used to assess how each vehicle is performing. Are they being too aggressive, speeding, or running stop signs? While the Urban Challenge is a race, the first team to finish does not necessarily mean it will be the winner. Safe and proper driving behavior is also required. All right, here we go at a stop sign. There it is, There's Virginia Tech makes the stop. <laughs> okay. The sensors tell him it's okay to continue. He makes the right turn. Fantastic. And there is MIT. Talos, number 79 packed with 40 CPUs and more sensors than, than any other robot on the course. That's Team Annie Way making a very good stop. Whoop, stopping twice because there's one of the target vehicles. Okay. Great job by the sensors on board. Take a look on second mission already, the 32. Virginia Tech, and they are they're looking. In, they're looking for a parking space. Looking for parking. And, and look at that. Yeah, that's great. Team Cornell gets things sorted out. So uh, after Knight Rider moves on, Cornell sorts it out, processes all the data, and now is moving on again. There we go, traffic moving smoothly again. These vehicles, I gotta say, are looking really, really good out there. They really are, they really are. And, and, and I know, you know, some people might be saying, well, wait a minute, they're going so slow and they're almost hitting stuff. And, but you gotta remember, uh, this is the, the baby step process. I mean, like we talked about 50 years from now, uh, we're gonna be looking back on this. Well, maybe I won't, I don't <laughs> think I'll be around then. But, uh, but, but the, those generations will look back and it, they'll say, wow, the, the infancy of this. Each robot is followed by a safety vehicle equipped with a disable switch that allows the driver to stop the bot if it causes a dangerous situation. These cars have been retrofitted with safety cages and seats to protect the drivers. Okay, okay folks, we have got our first autonomous traffic jam. Another historic <laughs> event right here. And look at little Ben saying, hey, 
You stay put, I'll go around you. There you go. Team Cornell stopped in the wrong lane of traffic. And Team UCF, Knight Rider, is at that intersection, at the stop sign, uh, holding up traffic there. It looks like Terramax came awfully close to basically taking a pillar and replacing it. I think in that situation, Terramax would probably win. The 79 is trying to pass and has <laughs> passed the chase vehicle for Skynet, the 26 vehicle. Wow. And Talos. now he's going to, and Talos is going to pass. Very aggressive. And Whoa. Whoa. Oh, we had our first collision. <laughs> Crash in turn one. And it looks like we may have a bot in distress. The 62 of Carollo. So Carollo is off course in that off-road section and uh, trying to figure out whether or not it'll be able to sense and back up to get back on course. Whoa-oh, uh, trouble. That would be a house. And that's not where the car is supposed to be. Take a look at Stanford, there's Junior. And it looks like Junior is making his way in. So here comes our second team to complete all six submissions in mission one. The bots return to the starting area after completing each mission, and team members are given another mission file to upload to their system. During this pit stop, teams are able to clean off their sensors. Once the file is uploaded, the vehicle leaves the starting chutes once again and heads out on its next mission. With the clock approaching the magical six hour mark, the first couple of teams approach the finish line. So we have our first vehicle to complete all three missions of the Urban Challenge. And congratulations to the three of Stanford and Junior. The Stanford team is followed closely by Tartan Racing from Carnegie Mellon University and Victor Tango from Virginia Tech. As they come across the line now, as our second vehicle to finish. By the end of the day, six teams finished the 60-mile course, proving to the world that autonomous urban driving was possible. Right here to the finish line. Dr. Tether out to greet it. Skynet as they have made it. Number 26, Cornell. Dr. Tether is out there with the flag. And he has got to be ecstatic. I, I can't wait to hear from him on his assessment of the success of this day. Three and a half years ago, when we only went eight miles, you know, people didn't think much of it. But I really relate that to Kitty Hawk. Where you, I can imagine, imagine if the press was there and said, hey, what's, what is this? It only went 100 feet, 100 yards. From there to now, I mean, that was the Kitty Hawk of this whole technology. And imagine this, out with not only people driving, but other robots driving. And that really scared me. I was worried to death. <laughs> and when it started, and we had them passing each other and at intersections to all together, it, it, it was an incredible feeling. The DARPA team sifts through the data well into the night, and the following morning, Dr. Tony Tether announced the winners. This one is for the half a million dollars, third place. Who got it? Oh, Virginia Tech. Here we go. Who got the million? Junior. Let's go to uh, the first place and see just who that is. Oh. 
The U.S. military hopes to implement the robotic technology used by these vehicles in future applications, reinforcing the goals set forth by Dr. Tether to save the lives of military members.